Hi, Smart Pack fans. I'm Smart Packer Dan. She's Dr. Lydia Gray, Smart Pack staff veterinarian and medical director. And we are doing our very first taping of Ask the Vet in front of a live audience. So we are here at TNT Equine to answer five questions asked by horse owners, just like these people right here. They're real live horse owners. <laughs> so I know we've never done a live event before. This is our first one. How are you feeling about it? Um, I'm a little nervous. I'm excited, but can you ask me again at the end? Yes. Okay. Right. <laughs> I'm a little nervous, but I think this can be a good good group here. They look, they look <laughs> like a good group. But... Well, we definitely got some great questions yes. from them, so let's jump right into okay. it. So, question number one was asked by Sue, and Sue wants to know what is your most successful hoof supplement? Ooh. Yeah. So, um, is Sue here tonight? Sue's in the back. Okay. I wasn't sure what successful meant. It could mean um, best selling, mm -hmm. which I have answers for that. Um, and I'm not sure which is first, second, third, so I'll just give you the top three in any order. And it's um, Farrier's Formula Double Strength, and it's Our Smart Hoof Ultra, and Our Smart Hoof. So those are our three best selling. I said maybe this by successful she meant uh, reviews. Mm -hmm. And those all have really good reviews, like um, 4.8 out of 5 stars and 4.6, and like 98% uh, would refer it to a friend, you know, mm. recommend it to a friend. So that was, to me, that's success. Yep. Um, but then me being the veterinarian and scientist, I said, maybe she meant research. Mm. Did you mean research? You meant research, right? <laughs> so I found the research for you. And it's, a lot of it is in uh, liposons, and oh. it's really fun statements like... Um, where's a good one here? After, uh, this was 19 months of biotin treatment. It takes a long time for hooves to show improvement. The horn quality showed a small but significant improvement. And in research, the word significant is what you're looking for. When the trend is significant, then you've really, you've really done something. Uh, let's see, uh, here's a biotin with a daily dose of 20 milligrams. Improves and maintains hoof horn, hoof horn quality in horses with a less than optimum quality hoof. Um, so I've got uh, one, two, three, four, about five research um, articles here that all say about the same thing, that, that biotin improves the hoof hardness, um, integrity, the quality of, of the hoof. Now it's not just biotin. Um, some of these studies also used uh, formulas that had, say, methionine mm -hmm. and lysine and threonine, so that the top three um, essential amino acids or limiting amino acids. They also used the micro minerals, uh, copper and zinc. Um, some had uh, omega threes and uh, collagen is another ingredient you might see in a hoof supplement. So between the best selling mm -hmm. and the reviews and the research, I think I have quantified success for you. So. Did I leave out anything? I think you nailed it. Oh, oh all right. OK. <laughs> so uh, based on that, it seems like looking for a supplement with some nice biotin quality to it, as mm -hmm. long as some of those other ingredients. Like yeah, the, the study said uh, 20, here's one, 10 to 30 milligrams of biotin a day, depending on body weight, mm -hmm. not less than six to nine months. Um, shows a progress in hardness, integrity, and confirmation of hoof horn in all cases. So 10 to 20 milligrams per day. And those three supplements that I mentioned uh, fit that. And I think actually the Smart Hoof Ultra mm -hmm. was 35 milligrams yes. of biotin a day. So. so you did touch base on a little bit here as far as the number of months for a hoof supplement. Right. Can you talk about why it was like 19 months? I can, yes, because um, hooves grow very slowly from the, the coronary band where the hair is down about a quarter of an inch a month. So if you think about the average horse's hoof mm. being three inches long, it takes a year for a hoof to grow fully out. So most of these studies were at least one year in length. And in fact, one of them said um, several months after they stopped giving the biotin, the new growth was poor quality again. Mm. So that's a really good study because it said it was poor quality and then we gave the hoof supplement and it got better and then we stopped giving it and it got worse again, so. Which is so interesting, a lot of people always start looking at the toes to see if there's cracking. You have to start You gotta look the where the hair comes out. Yeah. It's just like your fingernails, you know, the stuff out here is dead, but near the, the skin, the cuticle is, is where it's live, yeah. Well, perfect. So. Well, Sue, hopefully that gave you some good advice and gave you a good direction to go with. So moving on to question number two, this was submitted by Rachel. 
And Rachel wants to know, could you please discuss an appropriate dewarming schedule for the first two years of life, including discussion on developing natural resistance to parasites by not administering dewormer prior to a certain age? So first off, is Rachel here? Okay, so Rachel, you know how to get your question answered because Dr. Gray loves talking about deworming, so. <laughs> Perfect. I think I want to go with the last part of that question first. Um, can you read it again? Yes. So, so the last sure part was discussion on developing natural resistance to parasites by not administering dewormer prior to a certain age. <coughs> so I don't want to put you on the spot or embarrass you, but what the heck? It's live. Um, <laughs> that would be like that would be a myth because I went to the source of all things deworming and parasite control, and it's the AAEP, they have guidelines for parasite control from like all ages. They talk about all chemical classes, all different kinds of worms. They talk about fecal egg counts. It's, it's all there spelled out. It's like a 92 page document. And I read it for this evening. Um, and I printed out the page on the young horses, but they, they say that young horses should have at a minimum four treatments in their first year of life. Mm. And there's not there's not a, um, the concept of not showing the young horse a dewormer when they're young to, to teach their immune system is, is like the opposite is true. So you want to, the, the young horses would be considered high shedders. <laughs> so the most damaging to your facility. And you, you need to deworm them like they're high shedder. So I'm gonna read this part to make sure I get it right. Um, the first deworming should be carried out about two to three months of age. And that's what the benzimidazole. Because the worm of interest with a young horse is the roundworm, or the ascarid. And your ivermectins and moxidectins are the roundworms have now become resistant. Hmm. So we have to use something else, and so that's a benzimidazole. Um, the next deworming, the second one, is recommended just before weaning, and the assumption is that it happens in the four to six months age range. The third and fourth dewormings are at nine months and 12 months. So about every three months, you deworm your baby through that first year of life. Now they want the first fecal, fecal egg count, um, at weaning also. Because what's important is, see, the, your young horse mainly has the concern, the worm, worm of concern is the roundworm of the ascarid. As they age, the worm of concern becomes the strongjaw, specifically the small strongjaw. You start doing fecal egg counts in that first year of life to know when to stop using benzimidazoles and start using ivermectins and moxidectin for the small strongjaws because you can see in the fecals the eggs. So early on, the fecals will have roundworm eggs primarily. And as the young horse ages, the worm eggs in the fecal will turn to strong gel eggs. And when that happens, you can throw out your benzimidazoles, give them away for Christmas presents, because they're, <laughs> where they're useless in the young horse, right? You'll be so popular. You'll mind. be so popular. And then, and then start using your ivermectins and moxidectins. But it's really, really important to deworm the young horse at least four times because they are contaminating your facility. They're filling it up with eggs and you're, they're making every other young horse, um, they're infecting all the other horses, young and old alike. So the young horse isn't like building up an immunity or something by not developing, by not getting a dewormer. Correct, yeah. Can you say that again? I was, that was actually really well said. So Thanks. I know, here you go. <laughs> can, you, can you say it again? So, you, hopefully you, not. <laughs> So a young horse is not going to build up an immunity by not having a dewormer. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did we did we say that right? Okay. Okay. So yeah. So that's that's deworming the young horse. That first year of life is really really important. So we did talk about the first. She wants to know the first two years though. So well, <laughs> not to be greedy because that was a great answer. But that's what the fecal leg count then tells you because after then at that point on, yeah, at some point if you keep doing fecal on the young horse, you figure out when they change over to um, primarily strongiles, which is the worm of concern in the adult mature horse, and not so much roundworms. When that happens, you can start giving mm -hmm. the ivermectin and moxidectin. The fecal will also tell you, is that young horse, so now it's in year two, a, a high shedder or low shedder. If it's a high shedder, 
you continue to deworm frequently, a low shedder can be dewormed once or twice a year. So. Oh, for a low shedder. <laughs> low shedder. So yeah, that's that's be, be the first year and the second year. This, but the, it's all about monitoring. It's called um, fecal surveillance, surveillance and strategic deworming, because of the whole resistance. Yeah. Well, thank you. Hopefully, Rachel, that was helping you guys out. So we'll move on to question number three, which was submitted by Karen. And Karen wants to know, what is the best way to build up a horse to eating grass in the spring after having hay all winter? Is a half hour at a time each day too much? What would you best uh, time increments to increase each day? Okay. And I, then is Karen here? Oh, Karen there she is. is here. That's a yeah. great question, Karen. It is. And I, I liked it. I picked it because we're, well, I keep thinking we're at spring and then it keeps not being spring, but someday spring will, will be here. So good, good to be ready. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I think that introducing a horse to grass is very individual to the horse. Because like people, they seem to be horses that have really hardy, you know, digestive systems and you could do anything with them. Like my horse when I was a kid, I didn't you know, I just, he was great. I don't think I could have done anything to cause him to colic. And then the horse I have now, you know, a chew and he colics. Um, so if you have a horse like my first one, then probably an hour a day, two hours a day, faster. And but the horse I have now, I do in 10 to 15 minute increments. And so it takes me weeks and weeks and weeks. It takes me probably a month to get him to full turnout. Um, most of the, of the papers I've read on this do talk about a, a 10 to 15 minute interval as the conservative safe way. You know, but if you can go a half hour, like I, I, I tend to go not every day increasing it. I'll go 15 minutes for like three days and then I'll half an hour for three days and then 45 minutes for three days. And so, so you can see how it takes me weeks and weeks. Um, but it, it also depends too on your pasture. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a really super lush green pasture, then you're gonna have to err on the more conservative side. And, and you know, what's the harm in erring on the conservative side unless it's time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing that you could do is, and this is something I do too, if, if I don't hand graze, then I will muzzle him to slow down the consumption. Are you laughing no, at my a, horse? It's like a grazing muzzle. Like it's like the a sound. grazing yeah. muzzle. Yeah. Just the yeah. way it came off. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll put the grazing muzzle on just to slow him down further. And I do also try to use my um, fifth grade, seventh grade earth science training and photosynthesis. <laughs> okay. What grade was it? Mm, that was like fifth, sixth. Fifth, sixth grade. And photosynthesis, where um, the sun and water and air combine and the plants use it to, to photosynthesize, and then they make sugars all day long. And then during the night, they respire, and I called it plant business once, and <laughs> that, now I can never live that down. So they do their plant business at night, and they use up the sugar. And so there's a lady at safergrass.org. Her name is um, Katie Watts. She's a plant scientist. And she says the, the lowest sugar times for horses are 3 a.m. to 10 a.m. So turn out in the morning if you're going to do this slow approach to turning out start in the morning like i know it might be better to to hang graze at night when you're back from work but if sugar is at all a concern then that's not ideal um, the other thing the last thing i would add there's always an, another thing and another thing is um i like to tell people that at this time of year like a month before you begin to do this and then as you've turned out to full and maybe a month after, just to ease the you know, transition period, add a digestive support supplement. So something mm -hmm. with prebiotics, with probiotics, with yeast and enzymes to help their digestive system just make that transition more smoothly so that the hindgut is especially is stabilized. Because what the, the whole reason we, we change feed in horses gradually is not because of the horse, they have pretty good chompers, right? It's the bacteria that live in the hindgut. They, they get shocked easy. They have a very simple life. Mm -hmm. They don't get exposed to much. And then if one day they're eating hay and the next day it completely changed over to grass, they'll go, oh my goodness, and they just die. And then they release, they release um, toxins and then the bad bacteria mm -hmm. who are laying in wait, they, they opportunistically take over. So that's, I mean, that's the whole reason. So if you can throw some support in there, like some probiotics and things, 
it might make the transition go over. I even like um, a hindgut buffer to, to ease that transition period. And consider that the spring, I should say this differently, consider that the fall is just as dangerous a time as the spring. So if not more so because of the, the photosynthesis mm -hmm. and then the plant business doesn't go on at night once it dips below freezing, uh, below 40 or so. So they make all the sugar during the day and then they're just like, well now what do I do with it? Because it's too cold at night to work. So That's an interesting point because people forget about fall for They that forget purpose. about fall, yeah. yeah. And then we, we get lots of fall laminitis, mm. especially if you have a, um, a horse with Cushing's disease Yep. or that uh, equine metabolic syndrome and they're just their their threshold their tipping point is very close all they need is that that first those first fusing days in fall and then you've tipped them over into a laminitis yeah. so all karen has to do is do pre probiotics <laughs> get up at three o'clock in the morning and she's good yeah. well smart pack is going to invent a uh, an automatic gate opener <laughs> that opens the gate at three and then you just go out at 10 and, and close it yeah so We'll, we'll have that covered Patent for pending. <laughs> right, right. Awesome. Well, moving on to question number four, which was submitted by KC. And KC wants to know, are there general guidelines for time frames for how long it takes to see improvements from supplements? KC, are you in the crowd? No. Ah, OK. Someone raise so. your hand for like your KC. There's a gift card. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like we've been kind of leading up to this yeah, kind all of. night. Um, so the interesting thing about supplements is they're all different. Um, we talked about hoof supplements earlier. The, the hoof grows from the, the hairline a quarter of an inch a month, and it takes about a year to grow out. So you're not going to see the benefits of a hoof supplement until it, it might be even six months. I mean, mm -hmm. some of those studies were um, 18 months, two years. So hoof supplements, I think, Think are probably one of the longest patience lasting. is your friend yeah yeah um, on the other extreme would be something like electrolytes electrolytes are something like they have um, let's say sodium chloride calcium magnesium they they um, what you don't need what's excess gets gets um, excreted. excreted in the urine and so you can't preload electrolytes. Let's say you're going on a trip or you know you're doing an um, endurance ride or mm -hmm. something. You can't start giving the horse electrolytes a week before because they're just going to pee them out. Mm. So you start the day before or the day of or the day after. And you, you use them more as a uh, replenish at the, at the time. So that's not something that you need to start months and months ahead of time. Um, some other examples are... Oh, like a, a, a non-sweating. Yes. That's important to start. Anhydrosis. Yeah, that's important to start um, before the season. So it's not just that you need to start it a month or two ahead of time, but it needs to be a month or two ahead of time, ahead of when this horse is going to start sweating. So, so the, there's, there's variability in how long they take to work and variability on the time of year that's best to, to, to add them into the mix. To your point, so like with anhydrosis, mm -hmm. if you're all of a sudden getting to summer and you realize your horse isn't sweating and then you start a supplement, it's going to take a couple months maybe to see that kind of... Um, well, it, and it may not ever work with anhydrosis. Mm. That's a really tricky one. And they say that there's really good instructions on that label. And it says um, if, you know, when you start this, maybe ease off on the workload of your horse so that you don't cause them to sweat and let the ingredients build up in the horse so that when the horse does need to sweat, he's, he's ready, he's prepared. So in that case, if you if you like, oh, I forgot to put this in my horse's smart pack and I'm, I'm like a month late, then you're gonna need to back off the exercise and let that, let that supplement work. Um, weight gain is mm. one. So when I was in the, the horse rescue business- I see instant results business, on that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Twinkie day. <laughs> Um, when I was in the horse rescue business, it took, for a horse that we would impound, it took about two weeks to see a weight change. But I mean, that was a skin and bones horse. So I tell people at least a month, six weeks, maybe two months to see a change. Um, and in, if I had to make a general statement, mm -hmm. I would say result in four to six weeks, but give it two months to be absolutely sure that it, it is or is not working. Um, 
And, but it, again, it depends. Like, here's another one that's seasonal, insect defense. Yes. You know, that's yes. one that um, it needs to be in their system for a while, but it needs to be in the system before the, the bug season starts to sort of um, make them not attractive to insects, I think is how we, mm -hmm. is how we say it. Um, so we talked about um, time of year. Oh, and then also, are you expecting just to maintain the, the normal health of the horse, mm -hmm. or are you looking to address a particular issue? That's a good point. Yeah, and then that's going to change how long it will, because it, if, if you're looking to support normal, you may not even see a change, but you, you know yourself, I, I'm giving omega-3s, I'm, I'm helping my horse's health and wellness is on the, on the cellular level. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking to address an issue like the hooves we talked about, then you, you are going to be looking for visible so results. So let's say something like a joint supplement. So like Rachel has a couple of young horses and she might just be like, oh, I want to maintain and help support. So therefore she might not see like this drastic difference in movement. Exactly. She's just trying to support what's already there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's kind of your, your expectations will also depend, but will also um, inform this decision of, of uh, how long it takes for a supplement to quote work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there also a component to like, each individual horse, like how they might metabolize, like this that's feel the that's difference. always true. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just even look at the horse's basic diet, um, the hay and, and the grain, you you can feel, like I I would give my thoroughbred two bales of hay a day, and he was still a hard keeper. He was a four. I could never get into a five. Yeah, you know, and it's so it's a little bit in how your horse metabolizes. So yeah, there's going to be individual variation there too, for sure. Does anyone take like pictures of their horses while they're at the barn? Something I do like for weight gain is like, I'll take a picture like day one and then like a month later, take a picture, see if we're seeing results or if I need to switch to something else or address another issue. That's a good idea. And then I do a body condition score. That's another way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that or also, you can also just, use a weight tape. Yes, those yeah. are also very good help. Yeah, so. Pictures are cute in front though. <laughs> good point, me. good point. No, great question though. Thank you for that one, Casey. And we're on to our last question. So this is question number five that was submitted by Lisa. And Lisa wants to know, when is sweet itch actually sweet itch? And when is it actually neck threadworms? Ooh. Ooh. That was a Good really topic. great question. Is Lisa here? Oh, it's just two people. OK. Um, is sweet itch something that is common around here? Not, no. We've got a big head nod in the back. OK. So. Um, it, there's a little bit of a breed predilection to it. Like some breeds, some lines seem to be more predisposed to it than others. Like my barn owner has a lipizzan, mm -hmm. and I think lipizzans are a breed that is um, genetically predisposed to it. So what it what it is, sweet itch is, there is a, a Coolacoides biting midge. It's also called a noceum. It's a gnat. It's it's very very tiny. So um, the good news is that a strong wind can blow them away, and a strong wind can be a fan. Mm. So that's good. Uh, the bad news is it's not so much the individual biting of the smidge that your horse is reacting to, it's the saliva that gets injected into the horse. It sets up a, a body-wide or systemic <coughs> allergic reaction. So the horse can get one bite, and it can be anywhere, and then the traditional uh, layout of the the clinical signs is that the their mane it gets is so itchy 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 is the hallmark of this of the sweet itch but the uh, mane becomes rubbed out the tail they also itch mm -hmm. and it, it becomes they call it a rat tail rat tail and buzzed mane are the the way it's described the the ventral midline so the the belly but exactly in the middle gets all rubbed out and hairless. And so you look at that as a veterinarian and you think, oh, <coughs> sweet itch, except. Uh, always ex a curveball. Coolacoides, such a nasty little mite. We, or midge, we should, we should try to do away with these. They are the intermediate host for this neck threadworm. Mm. And because, because um, terms like threadworm can, be, can mean something else. There's actually a, a, a threadworm in the intestinal tract too. Different story. <laughs> the, the neck threadworm, the, the, word, the word I would like to use is Oncocerca. So the Coolacoides is the intermediate host for this Oncocerca parasite. And so when the Coolacoides, stick with me here. I'm with you. When the Coolacoides bites the horse, it injects not just its 
saliva that the horse is allergic to, but also this Oncocerca parasite. Mm. So now you've got a mane or a tail or a ventral midline that's having some reaction, and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, is it Swedish or could it be this neck threadworm, this Oncocerca? So how do you know? That's what I was just going to ask you. Do you start treating it like one or the other? Or? Well, this is one of those conditions that you can absolutely start treating and then see the response to treatment mm -hmm. and make your diagnosis based on that. And so the way you would treat and rule out the Oncocerca is to deworm. Hmm. You would give an ivermectin. And if it suddenly becomes better, then sweet itch wasn't the underlying culprit. It was that the coolacoides injected some Oncocerca. So you would start off assuming it's like neck threadworms by doing the deworming to see if you get a response from there. Here's actually where you start. <laughs> you start by calling your vet. Because, <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, many- You know your audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I actually didn't know he was sitting back there, but um, many skin things can look like many other skin things. And, and if you start going, well, I'm gonna save some money and just treat myself, you're going to find yourself down the road, mm -hmm. along, you missed the whole show season, you spent a lot of money, and your horse is miserable. So get the vet out and get a diagnosis. Um, and the diagnosis can be through um, a visual, a history, because sweet itch is very classic and it's what it, the horse shows you and also when it starts, time of the year and when it ends, and then the fact that it's very, very itchy. Um, you could also do a skin biopsy. And then there's a really cool technique where you can take the skin biopsy and just put it on the farm in water. And the, the larva of the micro, of the Oncocerca will come out and you can see them. Hmm. So that's a quick stall site test. Um, and, the, and then there's some, other, there's some other skin conditions that look like that. There's um, summer sores, mm -hmm. which is another parasite, Habernema. And, and so you need to rule that one out too. And that one can also be treated by um, ivermectin. So the sweet itch is a little bit more, well, it's a lot more challenging to, um, to treat because you have to stop the itching. You have to um, possibly treat the secondary bacterial infection if, if the horse has rubbed itself so raw. Mm. And then the main thing is um, you have to stop the midge from being able to bite the horse again because every bite sets up the allergy reaction going. Yeah. And, and keeping a, a, the coolacoides, the noceum, from biting a horse is, is very challenging. I mean, I, I think it's more challenging than keeping ticks off, but I live in an area with a lot of Swedish. I don't live in an area with a lot of ticks. Mm -hmm. I might change my story if I had to live with ticks. Um, but it's things like using fans, like I mentioned earlier, um, keeping horses in at peak times that the midge mites are, the midges, I keep saying mites, the midges are out, net. Um, having these things, having mesh curtains on your stable so that they can't come in and out. Um, using, keeping your horse, have, having a physical barrier mm -hmm. between the gnat and the horse. And that means from head to toe, covering them up. And I get a lot of, but Dr. Gray, don't they get hot in the summer than when you cover them up? Well, maybe, but um, if you use a light color cover, not as much as a dark color, but trust me, they're more comfortable being hot and not itchy than being not hot and itchy. I think I said that right. Yes, okay. I think you're good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, because to your point, a lot of like fly sheets now, there are some that are specifically designed for horses who have sweet mm -hmm. edge. Because they, they cover, they have a, like a, a area under here that covers the, the... They even have ones that go all the way up and like as like a hood yep. on the ears and things yep. like that. I've seen them go all the way over to the, the nose. Yeah. yeah, and like the material on that, I believe it's finer because those midges are so small. And, and it's stretchy some yeah. of them too, yeah. Because yeah. seeing a horse with sweet itch is the saddest thing you can oh, see. They miserable. just look so uncomfortable Yeah, they're, they're the miserable. Time. You can't do anything with them. Your whole summer is, is ruined, so you have to really you have to work hard to, to prevent that. But you have to make sure that it's sweet itch that you're dealing with. So for that, I would use your veterinarian. Absolutely, absolutely. Perfect. Well, that was it for our questions for this episode of Ask the Vet. You guys are fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much for having us up here to TNT Equine. We had such a great time. You guys asked such amazing questions. I can't, good group. I think it was the first live episode went pretty well. It was well. the first live episode. I think it went pretty well. I think you nailed it.
Well, was I wasn't going to say it, but yeah, <laughs> We'd love to hear your guys' feedback. If you guys think this more live episodes should be coming up, we'll see if we can squeeze some more in. Maybe oh, take you it on the road. You take you it on the road. You didn't tell me you were going to say that. Well, opportunity to travel. got to throw it in there. <laughs> if the crowd wants it, you got to do it. Oh, boy. <laughs> But next month, we'll be back in our studios filming for our June episode. But we do need your questions for those. And you can submit those questions. You can submit them on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, our blog, and the form at smartpack.com slash questions. Just make sure you use the hashtag AskTheVetVideo. So if your question was asked in a previous video, make sure to reach out to our customer care team at customercare at smartpack.com to redeem your SmartPack gift card. So until next time, make sure to subscribe and have a great ride.